being able to make this thing happen somehow, some way. <clears throat> and uh, I appreciate everybody making the trip to come and all those people out in TV land. Um, thank you for joining us as well. Um, so, Vernon, I'm just going to, that's right, go ahead. Um, you didn't even read my bio. I get to read my bio? Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, well, I happen to be um, co-owner and operations manager for Midstates Recycling located in Des Plaines, Illinois. Uh, Midstates is a family-owned business. We began operations in 1981 under the direction of my father, Ellis Brown, who was the former president of the renowned Simmons Refining Company of Chicago. Um, when I got out of school, um, I went to work for Brunswick Corporation and um, was able to pick up some technical sales ability that really helped me make the transition over to Mid-States because of the technical nature of our operation. Um, over the 35 years that I was there, my responsibilities have grown to include all plant, laboratory, gemstone recovery, refining, purchasing, and marketing functions of the company. Uh, I've previously served as a director of the NPA, um, and I was also recently on the NPA Vendors Advisory Committee for the NPA, and I'm currently the president of the State of the International Press Institute. So, um, but again, it's not about talking about me, Mid-State, all about education. And <clears throat> what I want to do today is help you find ways to maximize the returns that you get on your, scra your scrapping of your carrot gold, your stir silver, um, and we'll talk about some other areas where you may be able to uh, take advantage, especially with the new high gold prices and silver prices. Um, so getting started here, we deal in a lot of different things. Of course, you've got gold filled scrap, which uh, um, I'm sure comes through the door quite a bit. Uh, we deal with a lot of industrial and jewelry platinum material. Um, we deal with electronics industry where we deal with silver contact points, um, silver tungsten silver contact points, uh, cadmium silver contact points, uh, gold-plated watch bands. Um, I do want to mention before, I, so I don't forget, do not mix your watch band scrap with your gold-filled scrap. Completely different animal. Of course, we deal in 90% silver as well as uh, uh, the sterling, we've got your 90% silver coin. Silver oxide batteries coming from hearing aids and watches. Dental gold scrap, which is a very, very important topic that we need to talk about right now. Um, we'll get into the details of why shortly. And then you've got your buffings and polishing coming out of your bench operations, and of course, carrot gold jewelry. And that's what we're gonna mostly focus on right now. And then of course, we've got the other version of carrot gold, which is the carrot gold that has your diamond and gemstone settings, which is um, um, a very, very, Lucrative part of the business for you if you are separating and um, collecting your gemstones. Um, and I know Richie Gramp is going to be giving a presentation on diamonds after me, and I'm sure he'll have some discussion about Diamond Maui. Um, so let's talk about carrot gold. What is carrot gold? It's an alloy. Carrot gold is an alloy of copper, gold, zinc, nickel, and silver. Of course, in varying 
quantities to make the different alloys, 14 karat being 585 gold, again, with your other base metals. <clears throat> so let's understand what are we dealing with with carat gold when we're processing carat gold. <clears throat> let's look at a typical 14 karat alloy. 585 gold, 31% <clears throat> copper, 6% zinc, 4% silver. This is the periodic table of elements. Periodic table of elements gives you a lot of information about the different elemental makeup of a carat gold alloy. So when we look at copper or gold, we have in this column here that I've highlighted, it shows the melting temperature of gold, <clears throat> copper, and as we go down the list further down, we see the silver melting temperature at 1761 and zinc at 787. But even more importantly, let's look at the boiling point of the various elements. Boiling point being the point at which a, uh, an element goes from liquid to gas. So we're looking at copper at 4529, we're looking at gold at 4700 degrees, silver at 3542, and zinc at 1661. And you'll see I've put an asterisk over by the zinc. We're gonna talk about melt loss. What is melt loss? Okay, I don't know how that got in there. <clears throat> okay, so, my slides are a little out of order, but let's let's look at what happens in the process. So first we're going to run a magnet through the material. Typically you'll do that on your own first, especially when you're at the pawn counter, you should be checking everything with a magnet. I would do another inspection when you're getting ready to send it out for scrap. <clears throat> goes into the refiner. Packs it in, it goes into the melting department. And now let's watch them out. The technician is going to go through it with the magnet one more time, and then he's going to put it into the furnace. Furnaces are going to be operating <clears throat> at around 2,000, 2,050 degrees in that range. <clears throat> Remember that number, 2,000 degrees, because that's going to play into our discussion. So he's giving it a stir. Pay attention to the smoke that was coming off of that melt. So the smoke coming off that melt, what was the one metal that we talked about that turns to a gas? Zinc at 1,761 degrees, and I'm melting at 2,000. So that zinc is basically oxidizing and going up into the exhaust system. So now they're taking, they took the sample out of the melt with the pin sampling tube. They cleaned it off. We're gonna roll the sample out. Reason that we'll roll it out is because we do wanna do some preliminary XRF work on that sample before we put it into the lab for fire assay. Always better to be shooting an X-ray off of a flat surface than trying to hit it with a round surface. You'll get more surface area on the X-ray. So they prepped the sample to go into the lab. The other option, if we don't take a pin sample, is we can drill the bar. We want to take three drillings on each side of the bar. This is a practice that is standardized by the U.S. Department of Weights and Measures, proper way to sample precious metals. So it's three bars on a diagonal, flip the bar over, three drilling, I'm sorry, and three drillings the other way. Okay, so we were talking about the smoke coming off the melt, uh, off of the melt, which again, we know is zinc. 
Keep in mind, there are other elements that could potentially be in that gas as well, particularly cadmium. Where do we get cadmium? Solder. So jewelry that's been sized, settings that have been soldered onto uh, a band, you're gonna have some, potentially have some cadmium in there. <clears throat> now, this is a copy of what we refer to as our move tag. Our move tag is basically the, the sheet that follows the material through the entire process. Calculate melt losses is something that you should be doing all the time. The problem is, <clears throat> is there are too many refiners out there that do not show you this information. The, the information is there, it's readily available, but they're either not showing it to you because they don't want to show it to you, or they haven't set it up in their system to report that. But it doesn't mean that you can't ask for it. It doesn't mean that that information is not available. Everybody thinks that if you're scratching your head and you're wondering why your recovery or your payment didn't come up to what your expectations were, don't look at the assay. on my particular form, up in the top right-hand corner, you have the weight received that came in to the melting department or from the customer. Down below, you have the after-melt processing weight. If you do the math and divide the after-melt weight into the starting weight, you can come up with the percentage of recovery. In this particular situation, we had 207.15 ounces of metal coming in, 205.39 ounces coming out. You do the math, you've got a 99.15% recovery, which means you had a 0.85% melt loss. Another example, this is a big melt. This is a 556.9 ounce melt melted down to 553.55 ounces, we had a 0.61% melt loss. There's other examples that go on uh, in my handout there. Um, this particular one shows that the melting department actually found some magnetics in that melt. So they want you wanna remove the weight of the magnetics from the starting weight and then calculate your melt loss on, again, what went into the furnace, what came out of the furnace. <clears throat> Give you a story. We had a customer come in one time, it was a former NPA director, and he came in to witness the melt, and it was a rather large melt. I can't remember, it was easily over 500 ounces of scrap. And, I walk into the scale room and they're weighing the bar back and he became furious. And I'm like, Dave, what's, what's wrong? He says, the last refiner I was dealing with, I was having seven and 8% melt losses. Seven and 8% melt losses on material that only contains 4% zinc. Now you're not gonna burn off all the zinc. The zinc, there is still gonna be residual zinc after the melt in the alloy. The goal of the melt is not to upgrade the material and burn off base metal. The purpose of a melt is to just be able to get in and take a representative homogenous sample so that the proper gold content can be determined. The typical melt loss for clean carrot gold should be below 
with the norm being closer to 1%. Now keep in mind, we're talking about clean carrot gold. So this is going to be free of stones, enameling, price tags, bench filings. We're talking about clean carrot gold. Large melt losses are typically going to be associated with lots, again, that have heavy stone content, class rings, or enameling the price tags, the bench filings, or stray gold-filled items or stainless steel that were removed from the melt. But again, we can always calculate that out. So what's next? After the melt is complete, lab has the sample, the lab is gonna do their fire assay. What is a fire assay? Why is a fire assay? important. Well, let's look at what's involved in a fire assay. So the lab technician just received the samples from the melting department. So what he's going to do, he's going to weigh out sample. These balances or scales will go out to four, sometimes five decimal places. So he's weighing up the gold sample. The next step is to document, what did I start with? Now we're gonna start adding pure silver and we're gonna weigh up pure silver. And there's a multiplier involved. What weight of pure silver do you add to the gold pin sample that we just cut up? Now he's gonna add lead or litharge and then he's going to top it off with some flux or borax in these special ceramic containers called scorifiers. These get one use. Scorifiers get one use. Now it goes into a kiln. After the process is done, it was in the kiln for probably 40, 45 minutes. He's gonna give it a mix. All he's trying to do right now is create a lead, silver, and alloy of whatever was contained in the precious metal sample that we started with. So he'll pour that off. Now these are run in batches. So he may be running 15 different samples at one time, but he knows the exact order of how he put it into the kiln and, and in his dishes. Now he's gonna clean off that button because we have that flux or the borax that was added to it. And so he gets those cleaned up and he's getting ready to do the next pyrometallurgical process, which is called Cupellation. Cupellation is another, is an oxidizing process. These ceramic dishes that he's putting these samples in are made of bone ash. Bone ash in, in this application is engineered to absorb the density of, of metal, the, everything that's as, as uh, the density of lead or lighter. It will leave anything precious metal. So and now he's pulling the Q pellets out of the furnace. Prior to that, you saw him getting what are called parting solutions, all of the, nit the dilute nitric acid solutions ready and on the hot plate. So those are warming up. Now he goes back and he's taking the, what we call silver buttons out of the Q pellets. And again, he's cleaning them off, getting any fluxes or what have you. Now, what you have here, the lead is gone that we added before. Now all you have is the silver, the gold, and maybe the copper base metal and some of the zinc and what have you that was in that sample. He's now placing them into the dilute nitric acid parting solutions on the hot plate. Now I want you to pay attention to the color, what's happening. You guys know what happens when you test 
um, copper with nitric acid. You get that green. Well, this has got the silver in it. So you're getting a combination of copper and silver all uh, diluting down into the nitric acid. Well, there's only one metal that does not dissolve in nitric acid, and that's gold. So in that parting process, they basically drove off all of the other metals and only left pure gold. Now he's giving the, what we call gold sponge, a rinse with deionized water. It gets three rinses. It's ASTM standards, three rinses. Now he's gonna repeat the process one more time just to make sure that he did not leave any residual base metal or silver in the parting solutions or in, in the sponge. So again, they heat up. Now you can see the color difference in the solutions that time, they were very clean. Again, he's going to start pouring off the solution and give it its three DI water rinses. And now we've got pure gold sponge. So the next process is to transfer the sponge out of the beakers and into what we call annealing cups. Annealing cups are used to dry the sponge. So he'll start them on the hot plate, let those boil off a little bit, evaporate. Now you've got your damp sponge. It's gonna take the damp sponge still in the annealing cups, throw it back in the kiln for about five minutes. And he's gonna let that sponge firm up a little bit, get rid of all the moisture. Again, we're at our target temperature, our target temperature being 1931. And then those will come out. So we're looking at the dried gold sponge in the annealing cups. The chemist will take the pure gold, weigh it back on the scale, And we know what we started with. We know what we finished with. It's easy to calculate what the pure gold percentage is when you have those two bits of information. Now, in certain situations, there could be some discoloration to the gold sponge where you may have a little platinum or palladium contamination there is additional purification that can be done on the gold sponge. And then we can basically do the process again by driving off the platinum group metals and then dealing with the pure gold. Okay, so that's a fire assay for those of you that never saw what's involved. Now let's look at the new thing that everybody's talking about, XRF. So what is an XRF? XRF is uh, an instrument that sends um, an X-ray fluorescent uh, energy into a sample and there's a diffraction. And the machine has the ability to read the diffraction and basically tell you what the elemental composition of the, um, of the alloy is. So here he takes the sample, cleans it off, He'll put it on the XRF unit. He'll click a mouse to start the process. And he'll run it for whatever you have it set your timing set for. We've got this one set for three minutes.
you can actually reduce that down to 90 seconds most for most situations. And then it spits out a number. And there's your assay. So why do I go to all the trouble of doing a 34-step fire assay process when I can just stick it on a machine for two minutes and let it spit out a number? Well, let's explain why we do it. XRF has improved over the years, but it's still not a fire asset. So I took a group of samples and I sent it off to a third party assayer because I wanted an outside lab to run these for me. I used, it's, it's now called Amex Assayer Hill Street in Los Angeles. They're an excellent assayer. Uh, back then they were referred to as Daniel and Son. So I sent out this one sample, came back 41.069 gold percentage. We ran that same sample on the x-ray machine. Here you have a total of six or seven shots with an average result of 40.88% between all seven shots. Okay, the fire assay was 41.06 and the x-ray was 40.88. So I just, underpaid my customer by 0.2% if I did that on an x-ray. On a 10 ounce melt, that doesn't amount to a whole lot. What about on that 500 ounce melt? What would a 0.2% difference be? We're talking dollars. Okay, here's another one. 50.309% fire assay. X-ray result, 50.15, a 0.15 underpayment to the customer. Next example, 53.01 fire assay. Oh, but what happened? 53.63 X-ray, almost 0.6% higher than the fire assay. Who took it on the chin that time? The refiner. It goes both ways, folks. Here's another example. 53.136% fire assay. 53.49% x-ray. I just lost 0.3%, 0.25% on that one. I can't make money half the time and lose money half the time and stay in business, especially when I'm paying 98 or 98 and a half percent on your gold. So that's why we do fire assay. So funny example, but it's interesting, is our chemists were working on something and this came back with a gold analysis, and this is called, we shot this in what's called spectrum mode. It came back at 47.13% on the x-ray. We ran a fire assay, and the fire assay was 50.15. So there's a huge disparity there. But what is amazing is that this particular melt had a 23.7% lead content. Why did that happen? Why did the x-ray machine look at that and say, oh, you're only 43% gold, when in actuality, it was 50.15% gold? Well, the reason that happened is because on all those x-rays, or you can look in your handouts, as you read across, all the elements that it reads, an x-ray has to have a cumulative total of 100% when it, re when, it, when it reports its readings. So if we took all of these numbers here in this particular example and the spectrum analysis and we sum them up, it's going to total 100%. Well, why did that happen? It happened because there were no standards set 
on this machine to identify lead in the, when you shoot it on the standards. In this situation, it, it understated the gold because it thought it was, because it, it, if, if we shot it on the standards, the lead would have ended up in the gold. That's basically what would have happened. The lead, if it's not in your standard set, the lead would have been red as gold. And again, I would have paid for 23% of lead had I shot that on, with standards. Um, okay, let's talk about the newest thing that started happening in the last 11, 12 years. Everybody started offering diamond recovery. You may be solicited by refiners that are telling you, we do free diamond recovery. We do diamond recovery for $50. We give you free shipping and pay for your di diamond recovery. Um, you know, and we'll pay you 99% or 98% on your gold and do all this for nothing. Well, let's see what's involved in diamond recovery. And you tell me if you think I can do this for free. All right. This particular picture just shows that um, one of the things that it's to your advantage, if you do have a nice um, bit of diamond recovery business, try and clip your settings, cut the shank out of your settings, send the shank in with your melt and hold the settings that have recoverable melee in it and accumulate that until it warrants that there's enough diamond weight to spend the extra money to do diamond recovery. So let's watch the diamond recovery process. So the first thing he's doing, he's going to take the material and he's going to put it into the glass reactors. So close everything up, put the condensing column together so that we can cool the gases and make sure that there's no metal losses. Now he's adding straight nitric acid. It's a dilute nitric, that's about 43% nitric. And that goes in and we're going to do what we're calling a pre-leach of the material because what we're trying to do is uh, minimize the silver and copper in the process for later down the road. We can avoid um, excessive amounts of silver chloride accumulation on the material by doing this pre-leaching. <clears throat> you can see the color of the acid, uh, the acid coming off is green, so there's a lot of copper in it. Okay, so now is the next step. We're going to start adding the aqua regia. What is aqua regia? It's a combination of hydrochloric and nitric acid. Aqua regia is what you need to actually dissolve the gold and um, in smaller amounts, the platinum group metals as well. But um, this is where the real digestion occurs. Look at the color of those gases coming off there. Those are very noxious gases. Again, they're going up the, through the condensing coil. They're being tra uh, caught in a scrubber. And so we, we're not polluting the atmosphere because we're scrubbing all of our fumes. So now the dissolution is complete. Now we need to put it through a, a, a screen because we're going after the diamonds now and, and other gemstones. So even though it still looks like jewelry, it's, it's basically just mush is the best way to describe it. So he'll put that through the, the two layer screen put some DI water through there. And he's going to remove the diamonds, put those to the side. Uh, they look kind of dirty right there because there's your, your silver chloride caked up on, on all those stones. Give it a final rinse and then we're gonna 
dump the stones and we're going to put those to the side to deal with those later. Now we have gold in solution. It's called gold chloride solution. So what we're going to do is we're going to start treating those solutions. Um, we'll add different reagents to it to prep it for uh, precipitation. So those are now going to go into a ordinary plastic bucket. Again, all of our gold, all of our copper, all of our zinc, nickel, it's all soluble in that solution. Again, he's starting to add some reagents to it. And then he's also going to add sodium sulfite. Now, sodium sulfite turns to sulfur dioxide gas. Sulfur dioxide gas will actually convert the gold solution and will precipitate down as fine gold sponge. We actually stop using sodium sulfite now. We just go straight sulfur dioxide gas right into the solution. We just bubble it into the solution. It's much cleaner. You eliminate a lot of the salt. Now he's going to pour that off. And let's take a look what's left. Pure gold sponge. The solutions that he's decanting off of there will be tested with what's referred to as a stannous chloride test. Stannous chloride will help you determine whether there is still residual gold in the solution or not. If there is still residual gold in the solution, they may treat it with more hydrochloric and then more sulfur dioxide gas just to make sure that there's no residual gold left behind. And then those solutions have to be dealt with um, in a, in a, at a later time, and I'll explain what's going on with that as we get further up in the process. So now we rinse our gold sponge down, give it a wash, and then we collect that. And that will eventually go off to the melting department, and we'll end up with a 99.6, 99.7% gold bar out of that sponge. But the process is still not done yet. That's still not ready to go to the melting department. And I'll show you why. Because we still have diamonds to deal with. And you'll see what else is going to be in, in with the stones. So they just used um, photographic fixture solution, believe it or not. It um, is what we use to clean the silver chloride off of the stones. They clean up the stones. And now we do the tedious task of literally picking through stone by stone, piece by piece, to grab any that happens in the process. Well, this is what we're dealing with, is you're going to have undissolved metal. Well, that needs to go and get added to the pure gold sponge that we recovered from that melt because that's part of the recovery. Now, we will sort the stones by color, um, meaning that colored stones will go in one pile, white stones will go in another, and then we can treat the white stones with uh, hydrofluoric acid if you want us to cloud or etch the surface of the CZs to make your sorting easier. There's no charge for a hydrofluoric etch. It's not a big deal. It's just getting it to that point is where the big deal comes. In. So then they'll clean the stones and then they'll prep the stones to go back to the customer. So I can do that for free, right? This whole process, not a big deal. I don't think so. So expect to pay more for diamond recovery and expect to pay a reasonable price. 
Now we're back to the solutions. All of those spent solutions, we can't just put those down the drain. They have to be treated because we have to eliminate all heavy metals. So there's still zinc, there's still copper, there's still other base metals that are still soluble in that solution. So in this situation, we were showing a process, what we call zinking it down. And it's zinking it down, we can literally precipitate all the heavy metal to the bottom, and then we can decant the solutions off the top, treat those, convert those into salt water, put them through filtration, convert it to salt water, and then we can put them down the drain comfortably and legally. Otherwise, they have to get shipped off to hazardous waste treatment sites. And you pay money to do that. So if you can't treat it. The other thing that you have to remember is this. Whatever happens to these solutions, if they are not treated properly, and my facility ends up becoming an EPA Superfund site, you know who's going to pay for the cleanup if the refiner goes bankrupt? Well, they're going to go into the Rolodex or customer file, and they're going to say, you ship diamonds into mid-stage recycling for diamond recovery. You're going to help us clean up all of these solutions. And you, and you, and you. So it's very important to know what the refiner and how they are treating their spent solutions. Okay, we're going to really whip through the sweeps. This is the, the, the buffings and polishings part of it. We're gonna whip through this really quick. Um, all, all of the stuff coming off of your benches, all of the polishing materials and what have you, um, you know, you all have it if, you've got, if, you, if you're doing your own repair work and what have you. Um, the process is, um, it's not a melting process. It's not a melting process, it's a milling process. So what we do is we will take the sweeps, we will burn them or incinerate them. We will put them into what's referred to as a ball mill, which is a huge cylinder with hundreds of pounds of uh, steel balls. And that will actually mill it down. And while it's milling, it's also blending it. And then we will <clears throat> we'll, uh, put them through a screen We'll, we'll separate the oversized from the powders. Uh, we will do sampling on the powders and we will melt the oversized. Uh, my point being is, is that the, the last thing you ever wanna do is actually take powders from your sweeps and try and melt them. If you try and melt sweeps, you're gonna, you're gonna lose 15 to 20% of the precious metal tied up in the slags that come off the melt. So, uh, again, it's an involved process. Um, we're not going to talk about that right this second because we do have time limitations. Um, but let's jump to the next thing. We were talking about, are the melt losses being reported? Is the information available so that you can actually determine what happened in the process why is your payment what your payment is? So you're going to have, again, the components of a settlement report. A settlement report is going to contain the weight received, the aftermelt weight, or at least a proper settlement report should reflect the weight received, the weight after melt, the assay, and then whatever gold price you're, you're getting paid for. Um, Keep in mind that a lot of people, and you know, if, if you like to call your refiner and pre-lock your gold price, um, that pre-lock or that locking of your gold price should be reflected on your settlement report. So if, you, if you've got 22 ounces of gold in your settlement, which you've already locked off 20 ounces, then there's an additional two ounces that, that you have the choice to either put it on account or you can price it on the date of the settlement, whatever you want to do. Keep in mind that this is your metal. It's not the refiner's metal. You call the shots. When you want to price the metal, that's your decision. That's not the refiner's to determine when the metal gets priced. That's your decision. 
Um, then of course it should reflect the charges for whatever service it was, whether it was diamond recovery or whether it was uh, just a straight melt or if it was a platinum lot or what have you. But again, all the information is there. Everything that tells the story of the melt. When you have a report like this, you can do the calculations on your melt losses and monitor them. Um, the other option is you can always, a lot of refiners will allow you to come in and witness the whole process, which is uh, quite frankly, an open door policy. A lot of that is a real, real uh, comfort booster with whoever you're dealing with. And you should do it at least one time. It's a great idea to do. <clears throat> so the settlement report has all the date, date details, including after melt information. Um, this is kind of a funny little thing that I got. This was a statement that came from um, another refiner. This goes back several years. But the text in this settlement report is very specifically outlining the net amount of this check represents the fair market offer for your scrap lot. Key words. It's their fair market offer. Cashing this check indicates acceptance of our offer. And so on and so forth. Um, anybody that has a policy that says once you have you cash our check, you have no recourse, run as far away as you possibly can from them because guess what? There are so many things that we can do that allow you to have recourse, to come back and question your recoveries, ask for additional assay work, ask the customer, them to send you a sample from the melt so that you can send the sample out to your own lab and verify the assay. But again, I told you, it's not just the assay. It's also the melt loss. Well, the other thing that this report doesn't show you is anything about the melt whatsoever. Not a, not a darn thing. <clears throat> All right, your final settlement options when you're settling out the lot. Again, you've got your pre-sales. We can price the metal on settlement. You can put the metal on account or even a portion of it. Or you may want to take bullion back. You may, you may want to send in, you, you may have a standard operating procedure with your refiner and said, hey, look, every single melt that I send you, I always want two ounces of pure gold to come back. I want two eagles. I want two maples or whatever it is. And so then, again, that can be part of your standard operating procedure, or you can just do it on once in a while. But again, it's your metal. You call the shots how you want it done. So I've got my 11 recommendations here. Um, and I'll just go through these real quick. When considering a refiner, make sure you provide several solid customer references uh, or that you get solid references um, for people that have done business with them for a year. You always hear the story about, oh yeah, the refiner that I was working with, the first two melts were great. And then after that, it just went to pieces. So um, you want people that have a uh, long, long time working um, history with a refiner. All right, do the math. Bottom line is, if it's too good to be true, it is. It really is, okay? You saw fire assay, you saw what's involved in stone recovery. You see the processes, okay? I can't pay 99%, do a fire assay, do free stone recovery and cover your shipping. How am I gonna make money doing that? Okay, that's, um, so again, if it's reasonable, then great. But if it seems too good to be true, it is. All right, check the shipping terms. All right, if the refiner is going to arrange the shipping for your packages, make sure that you know how they're insuring it. G4S, Parcel Pro, private insurance, whatever it may be. If they're using the private insurance to do it, you may want to get an endorsement on their policy, on their jeweler's mutual policy. Um, you know, Seth could talk, talk to that 
that situation. But again, um, you know, or you may have your own private insurance, which is great. Um, and then you can ship it in registered mail or, or, or on your own jeweler's block policy. Keep in mind that FedEx and UPS do not provide their own insurance on carat gold or jewelry that is in excess of 10 carat. So you cannot insure through FedEx and UPS. You'd have to go through Parcel Pro or one of their other uh, associated companies. Double box all your shipments. Insurance requires that. You don't double box it and there's a loss. Sorry, I can't, I can't go to bat for you. Um, always include a packing list. You don't want to send in a diamond lot. And you didn't put any kind of documentation in there that, hey, this is for stone recovery. And it ends up in the melting department and the stones just go right into the furnace. You got to put some paperwork in there with it. I don't care if you talk to your salesman beforehand. You got to put paperwork in there. Um, seek representation. Again, this is where we talked about, can you go into the refinery and watch the melt, get a sample from the melt, uh, do your own due diligence. Anybody that is not willing to let you go in and watch the process, I'd have a real problem with that. They come back with excuses, well, our insurance company won't allow you to come in because of safety reasons or, or what have you. I'm proud to let people come into our facility. Uh, any, and, 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 and other refiners are, are, are proud to let you come in. And if they're doing business the right way, there is absolutely no reason why they would never, ever allow you the opportunity to come in, spend the day in the refinery, do your melt, uh, see the process, it's, it's interesting and it gives everybody peace of mind. Quite frankly, I'm more comfortable when customers come in and witness the melts because then I don't have to worry about whether if, if something comes up bad, what happens if the customer uh, puts some bad pieces in there? Well, you know what? I would rather that they were there than not be there and have, and then me try and deal with a customer that says, well, the recovery came up too short. That's just can't be. Well, if you're there, you know, it's comfort level for me too. Um, okay, request complete data. So keep in mind that if the settlement reports that you get right now don't have the melt information, call them up and say, I, I, I wanna see the melt sheet. I wanna see the starting weight and the after melt weight. Um, if they deny you that, that says something. It says a real act, actually. <clears throat> you should be monitoring your melt losses on every melt you do. That's a key thing. Remember, it's not just the assay. This is the easiest place on after melt weight where things can go wrong. And remember, I told you, it's not the furnace, it's the pencil that you have to fear. Anytime that there's a melt loss in excess of 2%, the refiner should be able to have photographs or things like that some way or another to explain why that happened. Okay, we photograph everything. It's just for everybody's protection. The other thing is if you want a third party sample to be held, for what we call umpire assay. You come in, do a melt with me. I'll give you a sample from the melt for your own peace of mind and for your own assay if you, if you decide to do it. I go ahead and I end up reporting our fire assay results to you. You're scratching your head and going, well, God, that, that's different than what I was expecting. You take your sample and send it out for a commercial assay, now you see what the situation is in terms of if there's a disparity between what your lab said and what our lab says, well, guess what? We've got the umpire sample. Umpire sample is a third sample that is sealed under the customer's signature 
And that can go to what we refer to as an umpire assayer. Um, that's a process that um, if, uh, <clears throat> if it ever needs to happen, it's, it's just peace of mind to have the ability to request an umpire. Uh, that should also be in the terms and conditions with any refiner. You gotta make sure that they allow for umpire. Um, here's again, request samples. You don't even have to be there. If you want a sample from the melt, the refiner can send you a sample of each melt. You don't have to go in for that. It just, again, make it your standard operating procedure. Send me a sample from every melt. Request that fire, that fire assay. You want that fire assay. And again, read the terms carefully. And then we talked about the environmental responsibility on those solutions. So um, keep in mind, it's called cradle to grave responsibility. Um, and that really covers my presentation, um, but I am open for some questions. Yeah, okay, so you're, so Fred, Fred is asking what other streams of material are out there that will enable you to grow your business, uh, grow your scrap business? Um, several things, uh, several tips that I can give you. Um, number one is now with these new gold prices um, up at $1,900, um, and silver, I think, has an upward trajectory as well. Lower grade materials are now worth more than they were before. So don't walk away from that gold filled material. Um, you know, pay the right price for it so that you are not exposing yourself, but accumulate that gold, gold filled material because in, in the end, if, if the stuff is running anywhere from one and a half to 3% gold by weight and you ship in you know, 30 pounds of gold filled, you know, that you pay minimal for, you're going to get a nice chunk of change out of that. Um, dental gold right now is huge. Why is dental gold huge? Because of palladium. Dental gold will always contain palladium. Now we're talking about crown and bridge. We're not talking about those big dentures or partials that are made out of nickel chrome. We're talking crown and bridge. Don't shy away from buying white gold or yellow gold. Uh, definitely buy the yellow gold. Don't shy away from the white gold because the white gold is 25% palladium. And palladium is trading at over $2,300 an ounce right now. So, and keep your dental gold separate from your carrot material because if you dissolve the palladium down too low in your carrot material, then you're gonna drive it down to below recoverable minimums. So hold your dental gold, keep it separately. Um, I think that's it, yep. Yes. Can I throw one more suggestion out to you guys? Several years ago, I couldn't believe it. Um, I'm in Chicago, Cook County, Chicago. Um, the Cook County Coroner's Office came in with jewelry scrap. Um, this was back in, I think, 2017. We ended up writing them a check for $113,000 of gold that was taken off of corpses found in Chicago, unclaimed property. Um, that gave me an idea and then they came back a couple of years later and then we wrote them a $50,000 check. Um, check with your county coroner's offices. Don't forget you have property and evidence rooms from the police and sheriff's departments in your areas. There is a difference between unclaimed property and um confiscated property in terms of the laws that apply. But the point being is that 
the stuff that is going to the sheriff's departments that is confiscated and the city police departments are required by local ordinance to be sold at auction. These property room and evidence room managers are overwhelmed with inventory. I mean, we're talking about inventories of 150 to 300,000 pieces of property that they are managing, that they eventually will try and liquidate. I went and did some research. Well, what are these guys doing with all this stuff? I find out about this thing called propertyroom.com. And so I start reading about propertyroom.com. I start Googling it. I start going onto their website. I start seeing how they're doing these public auctions. One of the things that stood out was anything that doesn't sell at public auction, propertyroom.com does not have to return it to the police department that sent it in. I started looking at the jewelry section and I started looking at how they were pricing jewelry. And amazing how every single piece of jewelry was always valued above the melt value. And when something doesn't sell at auction for melt and nobody bids on it, it ends up with propertyroom.com and they don't have to return it to the police department. So somebody's making a fortune off of this stuff and it can be you guys. If you've got relationships with your local police and sheriff, follow up with them. One question online. It really comes down to how much quantity you're shipping. It's not a question of whether you can force them or not force them. It, it, it's again, it's whatever, um, whatever your standard terms and conditions can be. Um, again, I'm not here to sell mid states, but I do not pay for silver in a carat gold melt unless there's 30 ounces of pure gold contained or more. The reality of it is, is um, if I'm doing, if I'm paying for 98% of the gold with no other charges and we're doing a five, 10 ounce melt or what have you, quite frankly, I need that silver as part of my margin. Now, if we start getting larger melts where I can actually start paying you at 98.5% on 30 ounces of content or more, now all of a sudden, I have the ability to charge you for the fire assay. I can pay you for the silver because at that point, if I'm going to charge you $100 to pay you at 98.5% and pay you for your silver, um, you know, I could end up, there could be $140, $150 worth of silver in that note. It absolutely pays for, for you to pay for the assay. Pay that extra charge to get paid for that silver. But again, you have to have enough quantity um, because otherwise they're not allowing the refiner to make any money. And you know what? It's got to be a two-way street. He's getting paid 98%? And he's paying a hundred and fifty dollar charge. Yes. Uh, well, one thing that I would say is I, I guarantee you that if he's paying a hundred and fifty dollar charge, he's probably getting a, a very fair count from that refiner. I think that he's probably, uh, you know, what if if they're treating you right and you're paying a hundred and fifty dollar charge, more than likely it means you're getting you're getting treated very well. It's the ones that do it for no charge and pay you at crazy rates. Um, so I don't know that I would have a problem with, with that arrangement. I, I really don't. Yes, you can get it cheaper, okay? We're less money than that. But again, you know, we do a little volume too. <laughs>
Oh, okay, sure, I can. And they're charging them $150? I'd have a real issue with that. <laughs> All right, and we'll be around for more questions. Uh, we have any, but we're going to wrap up now. And uh, feel free to reach out to Jack online as well as us on the next section. Like the mic, we'll uh, answer as many questions as we can. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you all.